What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host that just got a killer deal on some freaking blinker fluid. That's right, three freaking two gallon bottles for only 45 bucks each. When y'all start freaking running out of uh, blinker fluid like y'all did with hand sanitizer, who's gonna be rolling in it? This guy, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash stories about Kevin. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. This story's called, Je m'appelle Kevin. Kevin's Transatlantic Adventure I recently posted an experience I had in high school with a rather unintelligent Kevin whose stupidity was rivaled only by his libido. The details of this incident can be found here. In our junior year, our French class went on a two-week exchange trip to France. Now, I will say this. My French was rather mediocre. I only took the class because I needed language credit, and I proceeded to spend my adulthood forgetting most of it. My self-pursued study of Mandarin Chinese has been much more fun and fruitful. But if my French was considered mediocre, then Kevin was the Nickelback of Romance languages. Hey, hey, hold up. Don't act like you didn't jam to Nickelback in the credits to Spider-Man in 2002. Anyways, the trip began early one spring morning at an airport. By early, I mean 4 a.m. We were all somewhat sleepy as we waited at the departure gate, except Kevin, who was bouncing around like a bunny with ADHD thanks to a pregame meal of mom's caffeine gummies and three bags of M&Ms. I was sleepily working on a shiny hunt on Pokemon Ruby. For the interested, it was a swallow, and I did get it, but not until a quarter of the way through the trip. Anyways, that's when Kevin shook my shoulders and bellowed at me. We're going to Paris, OP? Do you have any idea what this means? Kevin, stop freaking shaking me. Okay, what does it mean? Lots of sex, buddy boy, and not just with girls from our class. Oh god, oh fornication under consent of the king. I excused myself to the concessions, where I purchased a few light snacks and a few issues of National Geographic. Kevin spent all of his money on vending machine potato chips, not all of which fit in his carry-on bag. I read that as crayon bag at first. He ate the ones that didn't fit and spent the rest of the wait complaining of dehydration. On the plane, I sat between two friends of mine. Kevin was in the aisle seat opposite of us. His carry-on was a bulging satchel that had only fit in the guideline box after five and a half minutes of squishing and was filled with Playboy magazines, a bottle of lotion, mostly squished slash crunched snack foods, and some Star Wars action figures. Oh, and a pillow that had been folded so much that it was debatable if it would ever function normally again until Kevin sat on it. For comparison, mine just had a book my airport purchases, and my Game Boy Advance. The plane took off, and Kevin screamed, like a five-year-old at Disney, until both one of my French teachers and a stewardess told him to shut up. He then tried to strike up a conversation with a female mutual acquaintance seated between him and myself, who I'll call Mel, about how much sex he was going to have, and if she would like to participate. She wouldn't. I talked to my friends for a bit until Mel decided to get some schoolwork done and Jeremy, another friend of ours who called dids on the window seat like the little crap that he is, went to sleep. I resumed my shiny hunt. Both my Pokemon and Mel's biology were interrupted by Kevin uh, pleasuring himself under the malformed pillow to a picture in one of his magazines as his seatmates looked on in disgust. When told by a teacher that he couldn't do that here, Kevin disappeared into the plane's restroom with a magazine until a line of elderly passengers formed and the stewardess had to intervene. Kevin returned to his seat, grumbling about adults not understanding the needs of today's youth, or some crap. Blech. Late morning arrives, the sunrise was a sight to see. What wasn't a sight to see was Kevin standing up in the aisle and changing his shirt because the Buffalo Sabres jersey he was wearing was sweaty from a morning of <laughs> wanking and slothdom. He put on a slightly cleaner jersey with a hole in the back and sat down. Upon spotting a few female students staring, he flexed his bicep and winked. Kevin was crap at reading social cues. Later, he offered Mel a pack of airline peanuts which had spent the past four hours under Kevin's sweaty rear. Around this time, one of Kevin's seatmates asked to change seats with someone after discovering that Kevin's earlier labors had decorated his boots. 
Instead, Kevin was placed between two French teachers. Early in the evening, the plane touched down in France. Kevin took an old lady suitcase at baggage claim because it was the same color as his and the names looked similar. They didn't. I'll call the old lady Gertie, which is about as similar to Kevin as her real name is to his. We regrouped at a bus, which would take us to our exchange school. The first week would be spent with host families, kids and or parents at the French school who had volunteered to host exchange students, and attending the school to experience the exciting life of French high schoolers. In week two, we'd all get rooms together in a hotel and do some tourism type stuff, basic for an exchange routine. As we walked towards the bus, I noticed Kevin carrying a flashlight. Hey, uh, Kevin, what do you need that flashlight for? We're in an airport about to get on a bus. This isn't a camping trip. Well, Fearless, if you had done your research, you'd know that France is on the opposite side of the world. From New York? No the heck it isn't. That's Australia or some crap. And what does that have to do with you strolling through Paris with a flashlight? We're on the other side of the world, buddy boy. That means that it's dark during the day and light out at night. So, I have this flashlight. I also have a sleeping mask somewhere. In the event that a night goes by without any sexual endeavors on my part. You can't argue with stupid, so I left Kevin waddling along the sidewalk and caught up with Jeremy and Mel. On the bus, Kevin was looking excitedly out the window at female passers-by, saying disgusting things like, The selection is better than my wildest dreams! and dropping pearls of wisdom such as, Why is she adjusting her coat? She'd look fine without it. Attempts to open a window, fails, whimpers. At the school, I was informed that Kevin and I had the same host family. They had a son our age, who I'll refer to as Jacques, as always, not his real name, as well as a daughter a year younger than us, who I'll call Anne. Kevin fixated upon Anne as an object of desire at once and began regaling her with tales of his sexual exploits in a bizarre combination of English and garbled French euphemisms he'd picked up from a friend of Jacques, whom he'd pestered for pickup lines. Kevin told all kinds of stories like these, all of which were disproved by his supposed partner. The only one that was true was that his third cousin had given him a schlobob on his 15th birthday. Jacques quickly became disillusioned of Kevin, but maintained his cheery, welcoming demeanor at all times when they were together. Mad respect for Jacques. Our days at school went by quickly. It was a good time, marred only by Kevin's insatiable sex drive. I swear there wasn't a single girl at that school who escaped his carpet bombing of innuendos. On our last day, Jacques' parents had gone to a movie, leaving us alone. Jacques and I were exchanging Pokémon and discussing our lives and French experience when Jacques went to go grab some food. On the way, he spotted Kevin peering through a slat in Anne's door. One gut punch later and Kevin ran out of the house. He returned an hour later with an empty wallet and a ton of food from a corner store we'd visited a few days prior. He then shared this conversation with me. You know, Pete, these uh, French traffic signals are real baseball pitchers. How so? I was at the crosswalk and it took so damn long to change signals and there was a car parked on the crosswalk, but there were no cars coming in that direction. So I cut through the street about 50 yards back. Kevin, that's jaywalking, which is illegal and a really freaking bad idea. Through a mouthful of crackers, Shut up, Mr. Lincoln. You would have done the same in my place. It should be noted here that Kevin regarded the Honorable Abraham Lincoln as the pinnacle of human morality for some reason. Something to do with him rescuing black people from Africa. I, I don't freaking. Week two begins, and it's off to the hotel. I managed to get myself roomed with Jeremy and another friend of mine, thankfully avoiding sharing a room with our hero. Kevin spent his evening down by the pool making passes at everyone with breasts, more often than not being shoved into the pool for his trouble. According to his roommate, he spent the whole night johnning off and muttering the names of people he met at the pool. We were setting out for the day when someone pointed out that Kevin was absent. Further investigation revealed that nobody besides his roommate had seen him that morning, and by all accounts, he hadn't left the hotel room. One of the French teachers knocked on the door to Kevin's room, and Kevin, assuming it was one of the many females he'd given his room number to at the pool, answered the door 
in the nude, meat in hand, with a bath towel fetchingly draped over his shoulders. His flabby figure glistened with water drops and the shower was running. Kevin was wearing his most attractive smirk, which quickly turned into a mask of horror as he flipped the towel over his head and down to obscure his manliness, whacking the teacher with it in the process. The teacher's only response was to say, Get dressed, we'll talk later. We spent the day touring part of Paris, where Kevin shared his theory that the Eiffel Tower was an antenna to contact aliens and people walking around on it charged it up to emit signal beams at night. Cool story, bro. He also predicted Skyrim's ending in the early 2000s by speculating that Arc de Triomphe was built to hold a rampaging Goliath elephant during the days of Imperial Rome. Today I learned that the Roman Empire existed in 1806, as did Goliath elephants in France. Screw me. We went to a cafe for lunch, where Kevin asked the head chef for pizza and called him an uncultured taco chef when informed that no, Parisian patisseries don't usually serve pizza. I ate lunch with my friend Mel and this exchange occurred. Lovely day today, huh? Sure is. What, with all the clouds this weekend, I was worried. Yeah, by the way, this baguette is freaking huge. Pass that knife, please. Oh, you poor deprived child. Kevin, what are you on about? If you think that baguette is big, you've led a deprived life. Come by my room tonight and I'll expand your horizons. After that, Kevin wandered off to chat up a girl at the bar and be scared crapless by her six foot two boyfriend who was built like a panzer and had just arrived with a sandwich plate. To this day, that is the fastest Kevin has ever been seen to move even faster than when he tried out for the track team in sophomore year. Later in the week, we visited a few art galleries, where no painting went uninsulted by the esteemed art critic, Kevin Stickass IV. He went on a 15-minute tangent about Claude Monet in an attempt to prove our tour guide wrong, about a Picasso. Good job, Kevin. He also urinated into an ornamental plant in one gallery because he didn't want to miss part of the tour. He would have gotten away with it too, had he not tapped a girl on the shoulder to show her his penis. Kevin was a big-brained individual. At the end of the week, we were back on a plane early one morning. Kevin was telling all who would listen about how he hoped that the plane didn't screw up my head schedule like last time. That's jet lag, Kevin, and it's totally normal when flying around the world. On the plane, Kevin began... Oh, God. <sighs> Kevin began baiting, as a master would, as soon as the plane began taxiing. This time, he was seated in the row behind Jeremy, Mel, and I. He kept leaning over the back of Jeremy's seat, he and Kevin had the aisle this time, as I had gotten retribution and beaten him to the window. Suck it, Jeremy. To spout randomness. Yo, OP, uh, Colby told me about your shiny swallow. Uh, would you trade it for my septile? It's not shiny, but it's a starter you don't have. Oh, you picked Sceptile on that ruby cartridge and traded over the other starters from your Sapphire game and Jeremy's ruby? You're a jerk sometimes, OP. Hey, Mel, if you get tired of those losers, you can sit on my lap. Might be a bumpy ride, though. Jeremy, are you gonna finish those peanuts? I ate mine and my seatmates, and I'm still hungry. OP, can you believe that not one of the French girls sucked my pee-pee? <sighs> this trip has been a failure. Mel's grandma came from France, right? Well, it's not authentic French, but it'll do. Uh, OP, remember that tuna sandwich I ate? Uh, well, I didn't realize it because I was so hungry, but tuna is a fish, and I have a fish allergy. He runs towards bathroom, returns to seat in boxers, puts on pajama pants. The bus ride back to school after we touched down in New York was uneventful, uh, save for Kevin spending every cent he had left from the trip on candy before we left the airport and being on a sugar high the whole way home. This was my last truly eventful encounter with this Kevin, a fact of which I am very, very glad. I have no idea what he's doing with his life now, but hopefully he's not screwing up society too much. You're laughing now, but Kevin soon grew up to be the President of the United States. <laughs> uh, you don't even know who I'm talking about, so don't get offended. I could be talking about someone in the future, past, or present. No. That is how you make political jokes without offending anybody or everybody. I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, this, this story was good. Uh, very much a Kevin, um, among other things. 
I really hope that was something he grew out of. And I really hope, um, I, I don't know, just the, the psychological implications here and just the possibility of the stuff he can do in the future if he escalated his behavior. It, it's concerning and it's hard to ignore that when you're reading these stories. But it, it's still a good read. Uh, this guy is a good writer in terms of just writing ability. But for real, that's really concerning because there were multiple crimes committed here, right? I'm pretty sure there were multiple, multiple crimes committed. And I'm really hoping this is uh, somewhat fictional at least because that's better than the alternative of everything being true and him being, you know, a pervert and uh, a f offender of a sexual nature. This story is called Kavina uses household bleach to dye hair. Hair melts. So, Kavina was one of my best friends growing up, more due to proximity as she was the nearest neighbor my age. Sweet and funny, Kavina was also not the brightest bulb. When Kavina was born, she had blonde hair. Naturally, it darkened with age. Kavina hated that, so she tried sun in. Her hair turned tangerine blonde. She hated that even more. So I suggested she bleach her hair, as in hair dye. I probably should have been more specific in retrospect. However, most 13-year-olds don't need to be told that there is, in fact, a difference between hair dye bleach and household bleach. Kavina was excited, said she was going to do it that night and go super blonde. I was relieved and excited for her, as I thought I was about to finally hear the end of the seemingly never-ending hair saga. I went over to her house the next day. There were tears in Kavina's eyes as her mom was cutting off her hair in uneven clumps. Bright blonde bits were strewn across the floor, like some weird broken halo. My mind was racing, struggling to figure out what led us here. Did Kavina use too much dye? Leave it in too long? Forget to wash out the sun in and some weird reaction occurred? I asked Kavina if she was okay and what happened. Through a mix of what was now streams of snot and those kind of tears you only get from ugly crying, she said, I do what you said. I use bleach. I thought my hair was really <laughs> While Kavina glared at me balefully, the pit of my stomach dropped from a mix of guilt and fear. Guilt that I'd apparently destroyed my best friend's hair and fear that Kavina couldn't handle this existential hair crisis as she was already super self-conscious about her looks. As she continued to glare at me from under patches of hair that increasingly looked like a three-year-old's effort to cutting Barbie's hair, I struggled with what to say. Finally, I stammeringly mumbled in front of Kavina's mom, I'm so sorry, Kavina and Mrs. Kavina. I didn't think this would happen. Now, they were both glaring at me. Great. There was a long pause as my mind raced about what could have gone wrong. I bleached my hair all the time and it never looked like this. What could have gone wrong? Was it the brand? After what seemed like hours of watching Kavina in absolute misery and just wanting to hug away my best friend's tears, I asked, Kavina... I'm just so sorry. Maybe it was the brand or something. What brand did you use? Clorox, Kavina replied. Oh, well, that was a much more lighthearted story than what we read before. Of course, that could be just because of the Clorox. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.